So let's move on from the V-Ray tab into uh, indirect illumination where you're going to have your global illumination controls. When you toggle this on, you'll uh, unlock those. You'll see uh, reflective and refractive caustics. Refractive caustics are uh, good to have when you have a lot of transparent objects in your scene. So uh, Reflective caustics tend to be a little too expensive to sample at high quality, so we generally don't use it unless there's a specific need in a shot for it. The uh, the uh, primary and secondary bounces are there's a lot here in in this tab and uh, too much to go over in this introductory tutorial but uh, something to be aware of are our secondary and primary engine or bounces a lot of people think that uh, the secondary bounces refers to uh, anything past the the first bounce of light which is actually not the case the secondary refers to any any uh, light calculation that is not directly seen. Anything that is not a camera or eye ray is considered a secondary bounce. Things that the camera or eye directly sees are considered primary bounces. So these these two options have uh, of different engines that you can use. Something to be aware of is when you set both to the same you can see exactly what your light cache is in your primary as well. So you can use the same engine. Uh, your quality won't necessarily be very high, but uh, you can do that. You can also set brute force to both of them, and that will cause everything to be brute forced and is somewhat closer to an unbiased render, but not exactly the same. Generally, we would use light cache as a very speedy method of calculating anything that's outside of the eye rays and brute force to do a slower, higher quality render for anything that we do directly see. And we'll go over very specific settings for that uh, in an upcoming video. Under brute force, there are very few settings for brute force GI. It's really just the number of bounces that it's uh, allowed to calculate. You'll see uh, coming up soon that the subdivs is almost irrelevant because that's handled by sampling. Under light cache, the number of passes relates to, uh, you want to set that to the number of cores that you have in your machine available. So if you have a 16 core machine, you can set that there. If you're only running an 8 core or a 4 core, set it down lower and uh, that's fine. You can always leave it up higher than you need and it will work just fine and use the number of cores you have. The number of subdivs, it actually defaults to 500 but this is resolution dependent so the larger an image you render you will need more subdivs for light cache to render at an equivalent quality so say you're rendering a 1920 by 1080 frame for HD general rule of thumb for subdivs would be to get close to the the longest pixel length so 1920 would be a fine value for the number of subdivs most would tell you that's probably a little too high actually and it probably is so 1500 would be a perfectly acceptable setting for an HD frame. But it's just a general rule of thumb and something to keep it. Uh, another thing to note is uh, the fact that any of these GI calculations, or most of these GI calculations, can be cached. So you can calculate, if you're doing, say, a fly through, you can set the mode, and then when you're finished calculating, you can save that file out and uh, load that cache from file and load it in and that will uh, prevent you from having to recalculate uh, a light cache or even if there are certain modes in primary engine bounces that can be cached as well like irradiance map so uh, we can go over caching again later the next tab we'll go over is the settings tab you'll see uh, the deterministic Monte Carlo sampler has some settings here I'll to give you an idea of what this is, um, this will allow you to uh, pipe all glossy or Monte Carlo calculations to the image sampler. When you set this to a, the image sampler to adaptive DMC and settings the adaptive amount to full adaptive, that means every calculation that relies on Monte Carlo will use this threshold setting for quality. Now that's 
something we'll specifically go over in the Neater Horse tutorial, but this uh, will be a very powerful set of controls for you. If you were to take adaptive amount all the way to zero, you would get no correlation between this adaptive DMC setting and the quality of your image. Therefore, anything that had to do with Monte Carlo, and that would include glossy reflections and refractions, um, area light sampling, anything that, uh, that had to do adaptive sampling, you would have to set each one of those individual subdivs subdiv quality by itself. So you would have to set the light subdivs, the, the area light quality by itself. You would have to set the ref reflection and refraction subdivs quality individually. And any one of them could have noise and others wouldn't. And it's a very confusing and painful process that those of you who've used Mental Ray are fully aware of. This can be completely avoided in V-Ray by making all those calculations fully adaptive and allowing the adaptive DMC control to add sampling where it needs to. Very, very cool. The uh, default displacement and subdivision setting is when you, whenever you have sub, subdivisions or subds in your scene or you're displacing, V-Ray will automatically tessellate. And this is your main setting for tessellation quality, which is your edge length. This is in pixels, I believe. So four pixels would be the maximum edge length for any given subdivided and tessellated edge. So that's usually a decent starting point. will give you decent quality. The uh, Sometimes we'll need to move down to three pixels. Very rare. I've never had to go down as far as two, and that will slow your scene down considerably and use much more RAM. So uh, four is a great starting point. Three is probably a, a better production setting. Uh, the max subdivs is set to 256, rather high, but considering your threshold will be usually be met by the edge length, you'll never reach that max subdivs. The next bit down is the uh, system and raycaster parameters. You'll s see this is set to low, and you should probably keep it there, because average and high are actually beta currently and may cause instability and actually longer render time. So um, leave that at low. Usually these defaults are perfectly acceptable and, and uh, are very efficient. The one setting you'll probably want to adjust is your dynamic memory limit. That uh, anytime you have to subdivide a scene dynamically like displacement or uh, sub Ds, you're going to need memory to swap in and out of for uh, V-Ray will need that RAM to swap in and out of. A general rule of thumb for that would be to set it as high as you can given your amount of RAM. So on my home system here I have 8 gigs of RAM. Uh, I would generally set it to uh, say 70 percent or 80 percent of the uh, available RAM I have. So I'd probably set it around 6,000. And that will make sure that you're making uh, making use of as much RAM as you have. The other option down here if, is distributed rendering. If you have it, it's a beautiful thing. It will distribute any single frame across multiple machines on your network. All you have to do is hit settings and if you have any known IP addresses or server names, you can just add them in and V-Ray will automatically look for them as long as uh, those, those slave machines need to be running V-Ray render uh, in the background, but uh, if it's running, this will pick it up, and uh, distributed render is is very cool. The last little thing to note is uh, the max render threads, and uh, low priority if you want. Uh, max render threads you can obviously you can tell the machine to render on fewer cores than your machine actually has. So four cores on an eight core machine, you'll only be utilizing half the the power, but that's fine if you have a, a reason to do so. Setting max render threads to zero s tells it to use all available cores, so I usually leave it there. If you want to have uh, cycles available for other things while you're rendering, you can toggle on low thread priority and it will uh, lower the priority on your render. So that pretty much does it for the introductory video. Next video coming up should be uh, some specific Niederhorst style settings for high quality GI rendering. I'll see you then.